Welcome to The Health Cost. I'm your host, Marty Smith. And in today's insightful episode, we are going to delve into the world of ADHD in children, seeking a deeper understanding of this neurodevelopmental disorder and the path to helping children thrive. Joining me today is Dr. Hanneke Haynes, a Cape Town-based pediatrician with a special interest in ADHD. Dr. Hanneke Haynes qualified first in a class in 2002 from the University of the Free State. After a year of working in the NHS in the UK, she started her private practice in the heart of Cape Town. With over 20 years of experience, Dr. Haynes values a holistic approach to care considering every aspect of a child's life, mind, body, soul, and family. Dr. Hanneke Haynes, welcome to the Health Cast. Hello, Marilee. Good morning. Thank you very much for inviting me to be here and joining you this morning. It's lovely to see you again. It's so lovely to see you, Doctor. I would like to start today's episode by asking you what inspired you to pursue a career in medicine, but more specifically, pediatrics? Well, that's a very, very interesting question. Um, I've grown up in a medical family. My dad was a doctor and my mom was a midwife. So I've basically gotten it in with my milk, I think, in the morning. Got a very story that uh, when I was a little girl that my uh, dad had to do a cesarean section. He had to attend a cesarean section and he was babysitting at that time and we were in a very rural area. So what I could do is taking me with him. So he took me with him, which went down the, the theater very nicely and I watched the whole procedure. And as I took the baby out, I said, this baby is naked. So I, think, uh, you know, I grew up being wanting to be a pediatrician. I always... Um, I didn't study medicine to become a doctor. I studied medicine to become a pediatrician. It was just uh, the first step on a long road for me. But I'm passionate about children. I love to work with them. I love to unlock their futures. I love to help them to reach their full potential. I helped families. I like to help families to, you know, help their children and guide their children to make the most of this wonderful experience of parenting, raising children seeing the world from the eyes and just experience the, the wonder through children. Dr. Haynes, uh, you are also a mom yourself. Uh, I was very fascinated to see in your biography that you also worked in the UK for a while. Would you mind elaborating on your experiences working abroad? Yes, it was wonderful. I, uh, I've been actually over twice. The first time when I just graduated with medicine and then I worked a little bit in the UK private healthcare, um, and that was really a wonderful experience, so much so that I decided that when I was qualified as a pediatrician, I decided to go back. And what a wonderful time I had. I was working in mainly two places. The one is Gillingham. Um, there are countries like close to London, but in any case, that was one place. And the other one was a little, little town close to Worthing, um, uh, close to Brighton. It was wonderful. I really enjoyed it. I worked in the NHS. And I had a good experience of both neonates and general pediatrics. And it really helped to prepare me for private practice here in South Africa again. Because uh, the approach to healthcare there is a little bit different from state medicine in South Africa. So I really had a wonderful experience. I learned a lot. I enjoyed it. I often do miss the UK. But I'm happy to be at home. I'm happy to be of help for patients that's currently in the UK. As I do know, your health service at the moment is not always everything that you're looking for. That's wonderful, Dr. Haynes. I definitely think your experiences abroad does contribute to the clients that you will be serving globally and while working for GlobeMed. Just moving over to our topic today, our very interesting topic. Dr. Hayes, could you start by telling us what is ADHD and what are the symptoms? Right. It's wonderful to be able to talk about ADHD. It's one of those projects of mine that I really love to talk about and teach about. So ADHD is one of our neurodiversity conditions. But as I tell patients, you know, it is not there's, some, there's not something wrong with you. There's nothing wrong with your brain. It's just that you've got a very different functioning brain. Your brain doesn't work in the exact same way than most of the other people. And the word that I explain it to children often is about sheep and sheep dogs. So most people are sheep. They follow the same than everybody else did before them. It is a very normal way. It's the easy way. You don't really try to break the boundaries. You stay together. 
And it's very, very important to have sheep because that's how the world goes on. Our ADHD kids are more like sheep dogs. They're all over the show. They're a little bit here, they're a little bit there. But they're the guys that changes the direction of the sheep. So they guard the sheep, they change the direction. They're the guys that comes up with this brand new ideas to change the world. So I'm sure a guy who did the internet must have been on this ADHD spectrum because it's, you know, telling somebody 50 years ago, I'm going to send some mail through the air. And then you thought about pigeons. Um, not really about the way that we do emails nowadays and the cloud and everything else. So it's these guys that comes up with harebrained ideas, some of them good, some of them bad. But like any sheepdog, they need a lot of training to get to reach their full potential. So as they work differently, they, they, the main problem with ADHD is that they struggle to focus. So it's this whole idea of that the brain needs to focus on one source. If they're sitting in a classroom and there's a teacher standing in front and explaining, say, for instance, a maths problem, they're not really interested in that. Their mind is going to jump to the lawnmower on the outside, to the friend that told them something during break time, to, you know, scribbling with their pens, to fidget with their feet, to do something else except, con you know, focusing on the teacher. And that's got to do with the way that the brain and the neuroanatomy and the neurophysiology is working. So our brain is very much consisting of road, very much like the highways that we've got. But between these highways, there's little gaps. And then the message needs to jump across the gap. And the way that, that this is happening is that the message is coming down, traveling through this nerve. And then when it reaches the synapse, there is neurotransmitters that is released into the synaptic space. And then those neurotransmitters then travels across to the next, to the receptors on the other end of the synapse, and then the message travels across. And then on the first end of the synapse, there is vacuum cleaners. And these vacuum cleaners then helps to bring those neurotransmitters back into the vacuolis rest, ready for the next message. The so children with ADHD have got too many little vacuum cleaners. So as these little neurotransmitters is released into the synaptic space, they immediately reabsorbed. And there is a lower amount of neurotransmitters left to bring the message across. And that makes that the messages are tiny. So there's many, many messages that is traveling across, but they're all at the same level, I almost want to say. So that focus of kind of, I need to make this the main message and the other messages, little messages, is not a, is, is difficult for them. So they cannot focus on one main message. All the messages comes, comes across the same level, I almost want to say. And that is the reason why these children are, are having trouble with focus and concentration. So there is three main big groups of symptoms that these children have. The one is then difficulty in focus. And then it's hyperactivity or symptoms of hyperactivity. And then the third group is impulsivity. But not all children have got hyperactivity. So not all of them is jumping up and down. Um, but they all have got this hyperactivity, I almost wants to say, in their brain. It feels like the head is full of thoughts. Um, that the thoughts don't want to quiet down. That they can't distinguish between these thoughts. And sometimes the hyperactivity comes out in that. So when we evaluate children with, with ADHD, we look at 18 criteria. Nine of them falls into the... Uh, focus and the concentration component of it, and nine criteria falls into the hyperactivity impulsivity group. And out of those 18 criteria, you need to be able to tick 12 boxes. And um, it needs to be happening from a young age before the symptoms onset, must be before the age of 12 years. So if you suddenly have concentration problems at the age of 20 and you never had that before, you're not going to fit the diagnosis. And the symptoms must be present in more than two places. So it must be present at home and it must be present at school. And then this, the, the problems must be so much uh, influencing the child's life that it actually has an effect on um, his ability to, um, to function. So it must be of a severe enough nature to influence quality of life. And that's a criteria. So if we do an evaluation, we look at things of, um, are they 
able to finish their tasks? Do they bring a lot of uncompleted tasks to? Do they make unnecessary mistakes? You know, mommy sits with a child the whole evening and he studies all the spelling words and he knows everything and then he gets two out of ten for the spelling test. Um, it's because they just write that first thing that comes into their head. They get distracted very easily. So you ask them to say, for instance, go and fetch for me your shoes and bring your jersey. And then they come back with a comb. They completely gotten distracted on their way or they just never come back. So morning routines can be a very, very difficult thing. So that everyday daily tasks, getting through through the um, waking up, brushing their teeth, getting dressed, combing their hair, getting breakfast, getting their books and getting to cars. You know, that's difficult. That's a challenge. Um, they are um, very forgetful, as I say, in daily activities. They don't have executive functioning skills. So any very big tasks or complex problems, they struggle with, they uh, can't kind of take one sword and then break it down into different things and then break it down. So it is overwhelming for them. They tend to be losing their stuff. So mommy loves lost and found because there's anything from a shoe to a lunchbox to anything there. So, so they leave their stuff at school often. They tend to talk a lot. So they can speak a lot. They speak, especially the girls. They talk a lot about things and chatter their mom's ears off their head. They interrupt conversations. So they often would say, Mommy, 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 Mommy. And Mommy said, just a moment, Jamie. And the Mommy says, Mommy, 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 Mommy. They struggle to wait their turns. And they all can be very busy. They're loud. So you know where they're in the house. They play loudly. Um, they are very generally very, very busy children. They don't sit still in class. They tend to jump up. They tend to distract the other children in the class. Yeah, so that's all kind of symptoms of ADHD and things that moms and teachers especially can pick up and then bring to the parents' attention. Thank you, Dr. Hanneke Haynes, for that intricate um, explanation, especially I loved your breakdown on the neuroanatomy as well, how you simplified that. Just also for our listeners, parents struggling with kids who are then diagnosed with ADHD, what are some of the practical measures they can implement into their daily lives to help these people or these children cope with, the, with those symptoms? So the very first thing that I tell parents is you need to reorganize your life. You need to become extremely routine bound. So it's, it's so important for those children to know exactly what you expect of them and how you expect them. And you can't give them, as I said, complex things to do. They can't do that. So break it down. So if you do, say for instance, we take the morning routine. So then have some pictures on the wall of a little boy standing up, then a little boy getting dressed, then a little boy brushing his teeth, combing his hair, having breakfast. Um, so that's a good way to kind of do, do the routine, do it every single day in exactly the same manner and the same fashion so that he later on, it becomes automatic for him. Uh, things like packing the, the school bags, do it the night before. Uh, it's going to be crazy in the morning, so kind of try to get those school books ready. Sometimes these children, you have to help a lot. You have to remind them all the time. I know it's frustrating, but if you leave it everything up to them, it's very, very difficult for them to, to manage it. I always say people with ADHD, tick list is their saving grace. So they must have a tick list. So in that, uh, so getting the school books ready. So have a tick list for him so he can check Monday is geography, Tuesday is um, maths and English and Wednesday so that they don't forget things because if you leave it up to them, they won't remember that. So teach them how to do tick lists. When you're looking at any task or homework or a big um, presentation or project that you need to do for school, help him to break it down to the very basics and the very practice things. So kind of. So, for instance, you have to do an um, oral exam about your favorite book. So, let's first start with choosing the book. And then you say, okay, you've chosen the book. So, next, about what, what is this book about? Kind of do it for him instead of just saying, do an oral presentation. Help him with those headings I almost wants to say and help him to fill in the details. And that goes for any task or any project. If we're looking at homework, so these children learn in a different fashion. So either if you're not uh, able to put them in a, a special environment that 
knows children with ADHD and can help him. You need to do a lot of the work, unfortunately. So let's look at a little bit at, at homework. You have to break the homework down to little things. They love to move. Concentration span is not long, so you can't say, let's go and sit, do homework for the next half an hour. Say, let us go and do five maths problems. And then you give them a break to run around the house. Not screens. Very important, not screens at that time. But let them do jumping jacks. Have a little trampoline that they can jump on. Um, let them run around the house a little bit or some kind of physical activity just in between the gaps. And then you say, okay, now let's read two pages. So if you have to read some things and you need to teach them to read, what helps quite a lot is to read a page and then let them read a page. And then, so then they don't feel overwhelmed with the task. You're going to get through the reader much quicker that way. Um, you can do things physically. So if you do so, for instance, you have to do a maths problem. Let them jump and count back from 50. Let them lie on their stomachs on a skateboard and do, do the maths while they're lying on there. Let them write their words in bath foam or in flour that you put down. Um, you don't have to write with a pencil on a paper. Bring in crayons, bring in colors, bring in chalk. Uh, you can write on the side words these, the, the words. If you need to do so, for instance, sight words, let them run and go and fetch sight words. Put it up on little uh, notices on, on, in the hallway, say, for instance. So say, go and fetch for me, dog. Go and fetch for me, train. Go and fetch for me. Or you say, walk, you know, you go to, on your way to the bathroom. You say, that word, what's that word? And how do you spell that word? So you need to kind of incorporate homework in a day-to-day -day daily way, but not sitting down and do homework. Also, lots of little breaks. Um, if you're looking at diet, diet is exceptionally important in dealing with ADHD children. So if you have got... Um, I always explain, if you ride and drive in a car and you put your foot down on the petrol and the car shoots forward and then you get to the, to the traffic lights and you have to put your foot on the brake and the car goes like that, it's not a very comfortable ride. But we tend to eat like that. We tend to eat foods that gives high release of glucose. And it shoots up and then this, it comes down again. So it's up and down and up and down and the poor brain doesn't know if it's coming or going. And that's very, very bad for children and concentration with ADHD. So what we say is these kids need to do a low GI diet. So what we're talking about is they must, the glucose must be released from the food at a constant rate so that the brain has got constant absorption of glucose and a constant neutral to do. And the way that you do it is if you, if you structure each, each meal at each snack, you structure around a lean protein. Um, so a quarter of the plate is a lean protein. Another quarter of the plate is that of a complex carbohydrate. So we're talking about low GI bread. We're talking about sweet potato, for instance. We're talking about brown rice or brown pasta, um, a brown wrap, a uh, seed wrap, something like that. And then half of the plate is fruit and vegetable. And by that way, you constantly give these children petrol in the form of glucose at a constant rate, so that their brains can function at a concentration way. It, um, it helps them a lot. The second thing about the diet and the eating is so important to take away all colorants, preservatives, and sugars out of their diets. These brains are super susceptible to those three things. So remember that I've spoken to you about um, that synapses and the release of neurotransmitters. But what happens with sugars, colorants, preservatives, it actually throws out a high dose of neurotransmitters all at once. And because that brain is an extra throw out of neurotransmitters, so, and because that brain is super susceptible to the neurotransmitters, it kind of makes them hooked to it. It makes them hyper and they start craving it. So you'll see the children with ADHD crave all the things they're, done, they're not supposed to eat. They crave those chips and they crave those and sweets, and they just want to eat it all the time because it gives them literally a high. And you can see the kids who's eaten wrong at a, so for instance, they had a school party and they come home and they're filled up with sweets and cupcakes and things. You can see them that often when they cannot sit still, they cannot focus. And that's why the diet is so important. If we're looking in a school environment, things that you can do in a school environment, the teacher needs to place them in front of the class. 
he doesn't have to put these kids at the back of the class. They need to be sitting straight and center. And the teacher needs to be able to say, hi, Jamie, listen, concentrate for me. And focus, just tap him on the shoulder, tap him on the head, just point to him again to his work that he's supposed to do the moment that she sees his attention is, 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 is kind of going off. Fidgets in a classroom can work. Sometimes breast stick. I know lots of children can try like to play with those. Um, if you choose fidgets, it must be fidgets that's not taking the attention of them, of their work even more than it actually helps them to focus. Sometimes putting some buttons, sewing buttons in the bottom of the school jacket. They can fidget with those. It's always whistling. Uh, that helps a lot. I put some, you know, those elastic gym bands. I put on the bottom feet of the chairs. And they hook their feet behind it. And they can kind of just gently um, move their feet all the time. Uh, working with these wobble cushions. You know, it's a little kind of a silicone cushion with little pins on it. Um, it helps to kind of help balance them and they can move all the time without really having to jump up all the time. Sitting on a gym ball instead of sitting on a chair. So at home, definitely, if they on desk kids, and if they're behind a desk, get them onto a gym ball. That helps them to, because they can't fidget too much, then they fall off, obviously. But it also helps them to move and by moving, they focus. So that's another way. Subclasses have got standing desks instead of a sitting desk. That helps them a lot, especially the bigger children, if you get to the teenagers. Um, standing behind a desk instead of sitting. Um, some kids have got desks in the, in the classroom, two desks. So they, they would move from the one desk to the other desk. And that movement helps them. These are the children that I tell the teachers, please go and Send him on errands. Some amazing teachers in some of the schools have got little trampolines in their classes. And if they see that the little one gets very fidgety, he says, go jump. Queen jumps and then you can come and sit again. Uh, or run quickly around the square and come and sit. Make sure that they're not sitting in the same direction than or very close to a door, open door or a window, because any person that walks past that is going to look at and teach the teachers how to teach their children to break down their tasks. Make sure that they get reminders to write down the things that they're supposed to do. You can't rely on the memory as to remember what they're supposed to do. Um, and then there's certain concessions um, that can be arranged for. So letting these children write their exams in a separate classroom so that they don't have to write uh, amongst their peers where there's quite a lot of distractions. Uh, giving them longer time to write. Sometimes they need a bit of a longer time. Uh, getting them from just somebody that's just the, and, and, you know, kind of from their shoulder, the moment that they, you know, their focus drifts off, reminding them to come back to what their task at hand is. Um, then we get scribes and readers. Some of these children need a scribe and a reader. So that's things that can be arranged with educational departments, um, especially when the children get into the higher grades. And that's all kind of little ideas that you can implement on a daily basis already at home and in school. Those are wonderful practical measures, Dr. Haynes. In some cases, it might be necessary to move over to um, medication as treatment as well for ADHD. And that can be quite intricate and intense, but that all depends on, on diagnosis and obviously a consultation with a pediatrician first. Would you mind just lightly touching on that subject for us as well, please, doctor? 100%. So medication is a very big topic and that has a very big So when we're looking at all the measures that I've, I've named, we, call, we talk about um, behavioral therapy. And that's extremely important, but it's so important at the same time. Sometimes help these kids just to focus. Now there's three groups of medication or this... Um, Two major groups. So we talk about stimulants and non-stimulants. So non-stimulants um, work longer. They work for 24 hours. They're not necessarily as effective with especially the hyperactivity and impulsivity. But they're very good uh, in children that has got more anxiety, that's very anxious um, because of the ADHD or because of other problems. So that's our non-stimulant group. They work uh, slow, so it takes a long time for them to reach the peak to reach them. And then um, they have to be taken every single day, and they work for 24 hours. Then we're looking at the stimulant group, and this is usually the major group and the beginning group that we start most children off. And there are different types of stimulants. 
So at the moment, um, these two big groups, I know that there's a third one available in different countries. I'm not sure about the UK. I know it's in America already. Um, and that's, when we're talking about the groups of medication, we talk about sulfenidate, we talk about amphetamine, and then this newer medications. And the world of ADHD is rapidly evolving. It is absolutely amazing how much new research is going in. So there's quite a lot of new players coming onto the market. But mesilfenidate is our oldest medication for ADHD. It's been, well, available for more than 80 years. There's been lots of research done on the medication. It was in initially marketed as Ritalin, but now comes in a whole lot of different forms. Most of our stimulant medications are basically medications that is coming across the um, synapse in the sense that it blocks our vacuum cleaners. But by blocking the vacuum cleaner, it naturally increases the amount of uh, neurotransmitters that's present in the synaptic space. And that helps that the message can travel across much more strong. And what's very nice about these medications, because they're blocking, we call them reuptake inhibitors, um, because they are blocking these vacuum cleaners, they're not throwing out neurotransmitters. So it doesn't give them a high. So it's not... Um, medication that you can become addictive to. So it's not, it's if, if you take the medication, they work. If you don't take it, it doesn't work. This medication lasts for anything between four, six, eight, and 12 hours. Um, as the child takes it, it starts working in a certain period of time. And you can see it stopped working at this period of time. It doesn't build up in the system. You don't need higher doses to get the same effect. Uh, growth and development obviously has an effect, but it's not a question of you know, because you're using, you get addicted, you need more to get the same effect. Um, it has certain side effects. That's very true. We know those side effects extremely well, and we can work around the side effects. Sometimes some children have got certain reactions to the medication that we don't find acceptable. But as I always say, there's so many different things on the market. It's not like an, if one thing doesn't work, everything doesn't work. What you often do is you, you try a medication. It's like I say, baking a chocolate cake. In all chocolate cakes, you must have some cocoa about, you know, in otherwise it's not a chocolate. But my recipe and your recipe are two different recipes. And what works for the one doesn't work for the next. So if I give a child a certain medication and they've got terrible side effects that they don't like, then we try the recipe of the chocolate cake. We don't say cocoa is bad. We say this specific recipe is bad. So we have to try our medic children on different medications to see the effect. Now, um, it's very important to, this medication is very individualized per child. So I can't say because this worked for that one, this one is going to work for this one. Um, it, because it does, it worked for your brother doesn't mean that it's going to work for you. Uh, we have to kind of find that balance between what's acceptable side effect and what's unacceptable side effect. We sometimes have to kind of just come up with ideas on how to manage the side effect. Give the medication earlier in the morning or uh, take a shake for, 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 for lunchtime because I've got a lot of appetite instead of having trying to get a whole meal into them. Um, there's many ways that we can work around this in, in medication. And it has to be individualized from child to child. And as I say, the, medica the, the side effects have to be monitored and managed again from child to child. Definitely, Doctor. When we spoke a little bit earlier about the symptoms of ADHD, um, in my mind, I was thinking, oh, I do that or I used to do that, like get distracted. Um, just touching on that as well. Are there other conditions that can mimic the effects or the symptoms of ADHD? Absolutely. So it's very, very important to look at a child and to look at the whole holistic picture. When did the symptoms start? Where are the symptoms present? What is the history in the family? Um, there's so many intricate things. This is not something like, oh, you've got some of the symptoms, you definitely have got ADHD. Uh, there's quite a lot of conditions that's causing um, hyperactivity. Hyperactivity does not equal ADHD. And I often find that some of the bad rap that our medication has gotten is because it's been given for children that doesn't have ADHD. And obviously then it has got mostly side effects instead of effects. Um, there's anxiety, neuro, uh, anxiety, depression, um, learning difficulties, uh, dyslexia, um, emotional upheaval at home, trauma, 
um, abuse, all those kind of things can very much definitely do look like ADHD and confuse the diagnosis. And as I said, remember, you must tick 12 of the boxes. You must tick the boxes when you were young. It must be enough that you can't function in your environment before you can actually make the diagnosis. If you are someone that has been diagnosed with ADHD, just out of interest sake, doctor, is it possible to outgrow this disorder? Right. So when you've got ADHD, you've got ADHD for life. Um, I often say you don't outgrow ADHD, but you can outgrow the medication. So what this is about is because what we do with medication, we really help children and people with ADHD to focus and to concentrate, and we kind of prepare the brain to learn. So we, by normalizing those neurotransmitters, prepare the brain and make the brain ready for growth, development, and learning. And what happens then is that the, ad, the, the child grows up learning certain coping techniques, coping mechanisms, and they get positive feedback all the time. And then they get to a point where they don't necessarily have to take medication to get that focus. But although, you know, they've gone into a, an environment where they really need their creativity juices to flow and they are able to kind of adjust their day in such a manner that they can do those kind of things. So they don't need to take medication, but they haven't outgrown their ADHD or they actually have learned to use their ADHD to their advantage. I've got a family, or not a, fam uh, yeah, a family of patients. The father came to see me with his child and halfway through the consultation, it was very clear that he also has ADHD, and I asked him whether he's been diagnosed. He said, actually not, but all of what I'm saying makes very much sense. He struggled at school quite a lot and everything else. And I said, so what do you do now? And he said a very interesting thing. He said he is a photographer, but he is a journalistic photographer, and he goes into dangerous zones to do photography there. And he actually uses his ADHD as a skill to do his trade. It's because he's completely aware of every little thing that happens in his environment. He's not, not going to be caught unaware when there's bullets flying, for instance. Um, he, and then he uses his lens of his camera to focus, to, to keep his attention to one specific task. So that's what I'm talking about, is learning and adapting. And that training of that sheepdog that I spoke to you about, it's so, so, so important to train and to help and to guide your child so that they can reach their full potential and actually uses their ADHD as their advantage. But if we don't treat and if we just ignore the problem, there are a whole bag of problems that comes with it. And I'm quickly going to go into that if, if that's okay. Yeah. What, we talk, what we've got, if you've got, I always say there's a glass vase in start, instead of each child. And that glass vase is what he thinks about himself. Because it's glass, it breaks very, very easily. And when you have to put it back together, it's very difficult. So if you think about a young child going into a class and he has got ADHD, he is going to be talking a lot. He is going to make mistakes. He is going to be distracted. So very quickly, he's going to get, sit down, concentrate, focus, do better. I know you can do this. Try again. You are naughty. Stand in the naughty corner. Go to the principal, you know. And the child is later on going to start believing the narrative. He's going to get scolded a lot more than the other children. He's going to not. He's going to try extremely hard. He's going to give his very best. And then he's going to fail. But you know, later on they start believing that they can't do this. They're stupid. They're dumb. They, you know, it's not worthwhile trying. Um, when they try to make friends, because they say the first thing that comes into their mind, you know them. Academic A student kind of kids don't want to play with him. And he's going to start hanging around the naughty children, the other kids that's like him, and then getting into a lot of trouble in that way. Once they start not believing in themselves, then things like anxiety and depression is just a short way behind. Um, and once we start getting those kind of problems, that has got its own compl you know, complications together with that. Um, if they're growing up into teenagers, because they're really impulsive, they tend to do things like got risk-taking behaviors. We all know about, um, you know, drugs and things that they can double in. They can um, take risks when they jump a red robot. Risk-taking behavior in their sexual lives. You know, there's all kinds of trouble that they can come into. 
And then growing up as adults, it's difficult then for them to kind of uh, do certain tasks. They have got marital problems, relationship problems. They don't even learn how to deal with all these things. Um, the brain of ADHD itself is exceptionally susceptible to becoming to addictions. And that goes to all kinds of addictions. Um, because what happens with anything that a person gets addicted to, it gives that release of neurotransmitter that gives them a high and their brain is extremely susceptible, much more so than the person without ADHD to get addicted. And the one addiction that I really want to talk about quickly is, is screen times. The children with ADHD all have got a screen addiction. If you speak to the parents, you will, they will say they love the computer. They love the iPad. They're great at it, and which is true. But they actually get so quickly, so addicted to it, that they cannot function without it any. I've just this past week, I've seen a little boy that I've spoken about. He's eight or nine. You know, he stopped playing soccer. He can't get wait to get home to to see his computer. If the mom takes the the the, the switches off, you know, the computer or something, he gets rude. He throws temper tantrums. He gets up at night time to go and switch it on to play his game. So that's all signs of addictions. You know, he needs more and more and more of it. He stops doing anything else. He's, you know, crave it literally. He can't focus on anything else. So it's an addiction that we see in our little children. So screen addictions needs to be managed. Uh, it's part of our daily life. So you can't just completely exclude it. But it has to be managed very, very, very carefully. So it's extremely important that we do know that we have to be aware of these risk factors that people with ADHD have. And you have to mitigate that and you have to help your child to understand his, 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 his wonderful characteristics, but also where the potholes lie and how to stay clear of them. Just wrapping up our episode today as well, would you mind giving our listeners a final thought on your opinion regarding ADHD? Right, so our children with ADHD are lovely, beautiful, amazing children. I love working with them. And I love unlocking them. I love to help them to reach their full potential. Also, actually, to see their full potential. It's amazing where a little guy that really, really, really struggled, I always say, like running a race, you have to run hurdles. Your friends are all running sprints to take those hurdles away and unlock that child. But these kids do need help. So it's important to recognize them. So if you've got a child that you suspect might be having ADHD, get help. Start implementing the things that you can do. Change the diet, help with the homework, putting, you know, lists in place, anything else. Seek medical help. Find out. Do your research. Um, there's so much we can do for them. If you have tried medication or you, if you think medication is not working or you've got a bad experience or you hear from people that has got bad experiences, speak to your health professional so that your health professional can help you phase out because there is something that you or your child can take that is going to help. So don't just throw everything out. Let's work. Let's help. Let's help to unlock your child and let him get that full potential and fly. Dr. Haynes, thank you so, so much for taking the time to speak to me today. It was a pleasure. It was lovely to speak to you and to the listeners. And I really do hope all of you learned something today and I'm there to help anytime. That wraps up today's episode with the lovely Dr. Hanika Haynes and the journey to helping children with ADHD thrive. This podcast is powered by Globe Made UK, giving you access to the best doctors, treatments, and medical specialists worldwide.